we are going to actually play a game instead of just killing you with the PowerPoint, okay? Um, first, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Officer Kelly McKeithen. Um, you may have seen me on TV or heard me on the radio. Um, I'm the Public Information Officer for the Bryan Police Department. Do I need to be closer to this thing so you can get it? Okay. Um, I have been with the Bryan Police Department for 17 years and uh, started off on patrol. Everybody has to start off on patrol. Oh, yes, y'all got some more teammates. <laughs> um, and then I was a detective for six years, and I did white-collar crimes and crimes against uh, children uh, and sexual assault-type um, offenses. I volunteered for the crisis negotiation team. It's not an assignment on its own. It's, we just volunteer, and then in our, if we get a call out, we go to that. Um, and I was on that team. I forgot how many years four, maybe four or five years, but I got off when I uh, became the public information officer because I'm on call 24 It'd be kind of hard to carry both hats. Um, I am also currently on the Honor Guard team, which is another volunteer uh, assignment, and we respond to, like if there's an officer um, death in the line of duty, we do all the Honor Guard duties for that, or sometimes if a reserve, I mean, I'm sorry, a retired officer passes away, then we might have just some minor duties at those funerals. And then currently, I'm the PIO. I've been in that position for five years. I give information to the media and um, in various ways and try to push out uh, public service announcements uh, for the police department. Let me let Sergeant Bona introduce himself here. Howdy. Howdy. Everybody with a mouthful of pizza, right? <laughs> That's the best time to do that. Uh, my name is Ryan Bona. I work for Kelly. Uh, technically, I'm her supervisor, but she tells me where to go and what to do. Uh, I've been with the Bryan Police Department for a little over 13 years now. Um, I spent 10 of those years on night shift patrol, both as an officer and as a supervisor. I'm part vampire, uh, and I love the dark. So I'm still, even though I've been doing what I do now for about three years, I still have a hard time waking up in the morning. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? Uh, and that big orange ball in the sky really blinds me. So <laughs> I did that. I was also a field training officer. Um, I've been a sergeant since 2008. Again, I spent most of my time in the patrol division. Uh, I've done a little bit of op uh, special operations with our burglaries. How many of y'all have ever been a victim of burglary? <laughs> See, that's way too many hands. Uh, a few times I've been the commander of our burglary task force and had a good time doing that. Uh, currently I work in administration. I work with the chiefs and the assistant chiefs and Kelly. Uh, a lot of people ask me what an administrative sergeant does. I don't know, but I do a lot of it. Uh, I do everything that needs to be done that doesn't fall under anybody's specific job description. And I kind of go out and make work. Uh, I try to find ways to engage the community and to, to be more involved with the police department and that bridge the gap between the officers and the citizens. Um, I teach quite a bit. I'm one of our instructors. I teach both at our police academy and both continuing education for officers. I love playing with stuff like guns. So I'm one of our armorers. I fix just about every type of weapon system that we have at the police department. Uh, I'm also on the honor guard with Kelly. I'm one of the supervisors on the honor guard. Again, we do like line of duty death things and. Uh, you know, we dress white gloves and salute, do all that kind of stuff with flags. Um, I'm also the MFF, it was too long to put out there, that's Mobile Field Force. And that's kind of our, uh, for lack of a better word, a riot control or a response to a large crowd, like we had at the mall last year, if I know what I'm talking about, when they had the carnival at the mall. But that was pre-MFF. That was pre-MFF, <laughs> but we would respond to that and show up and try to get crowds to disperse. We're not always a tactical unit, using force. A lot of times we're just there for presence. I'm also a squad leader on the mobile field force. And I didn't know how to word it, but I'm kind of the volunteer coordinator for the police department. We have a lot of volunteers that come in that help the police department go out and engage the community and be involved in a lot of different processes. And they pretty much all come from my desk. So I wear a lot of different hats. Again, I work for Kelly. She tells me where to go and what to do, so she told me I have to go stand at the board now, so I'm going to go stand at the board. If y'all got any questions, follow me. And thank y'all for coming again. I really appreciate it. <laughs> okay. So like I said, we are going to play Jeopardy. Okay? So if you want to squeeze in closer to the people on your row, we have Team 1 here in the front. Woo! Team, team two 1! Team 2 in the middle. Yay! Yay. And Team 3 in the back. Yay! 
Now we're not going to play it exactly like Jeopardy. You don't have to answer with a question. Um, and we gave you a few of the answers already. So um, what you'll need to do is we'll kind of go with team one first instead of, you know, if you win the question, you get to pick the, the question. So team one, the, the young lady right here closest to me, gets to pick the first category. And the first team to, how do we want to do this? Raise our hands. We forgot the noisemakers. Mm. Um, we didn't bring noisemakers. Yeah, we didn't bring noisemakers. So first person, I don't want to make y'all have to stand up real quick. So the first person who gets their hand up in the air, we will let them take the answer, the first answer. And then we'll give you the points according to um, as we go. Okay. Yes, so we're going to be passing. We may not get through all of them. So which category and which amount would you like to choose? How about general for five? Whoa, we're going big <laughs> off the top of the bat. Okay, general for 500. This is our value statement. The members of the Bryan Police Department are committed to a set of values that guide our organization and assist to perform our duties in an exceptional manner. They include the word pride. That is an acronym. Can anyone tell me one of the letters they think that PRID stands for? Yes, ma'am. No. <laughs> yeah. Respect. Yes, I think good. both of y'all said it. <laughs> team, team, two. Team, team two got it. Team two. 500. Yeah. Very good. Okay. So professionalism, respect, integrity, dedication, and ethics. And we do follow this very well. Okay, so let's go back to categories. All right. Cindy. Uh, how about community, no, criminal investigations for 500? 500. Wow, we've got some daring people here. Okay, give three possible ways to develop leads in a case. So you have to have all three of them. Cindy had her hand up first. Witnesses. Okay. Evidence. All right. And um, surveillance. Yes. I'll take that. Ooh, wow. Okay. Oh, Team two. All right. We have witnesses, witness statements. Um, now, although we get witness statements, we have to take a little bit of stock in it because sometimes witnesses get things wrong. So we have to, if we have two witnesses that say the same thing, then we're getting closer to saying, yes, that did happen. But we've had it before where witnesses have given information because in the stress of the moment, that's what they thought they saw. Uh, photo lineups. Again, that's very subjective. Some people may not remember exact faces and pick someone out who looks very similar. I will tell you a story. When I was a sex crimes detective, I had a case um, where we had um, a guy who was exposing himself at apartment complexes. I had witnesses who pointed this guy out. Um, we had multiple contacts in the apartment complex, had a vehicle description that they gave me. I found a guy at that, who lived there who had that same vehicle, who fit the exact description, put him in a photo, photo lineup. Three people picked the same guy out. He got arrested. It was the wrong guy. And the reason why we know that was because another detective was working a case similar to this that happened like probably a month after it started up again. And they had a witness who followed the suspect back. We contacted that suspect, and he put out the photo amongst all the officers. And I looked at it, and I went, oh, my God, this looks exactly like my suspect. So I went to the DA immediately, and I said, look, I think, I think we have the wrong guy on my case. I think it's this guy. And so we gave immunity to the bad guy to get the other guy off. So we went to him, questioned him about the, my cases to see if I could link him to one of those because otherwise he wasn't going to talk to me. But I felt it was that important to get the charges dropped on this other person. And so we did that. Uh, Crime Stoppers, informants, polygraph, evidence processing, neighborhood canvases, sketch artist, and content of statements. Uh, let's see. Go back. Okay. So team three. Lady in blue. Or lady in red. <laughs> Patrol five. Patrol five. Okay. When is deadly force justified? Yeah. We may need to think of the answer before we throw that hand up. I'll take it. Team one, 500, okay? Um, which says, when an officer reasonably, reasonably believes it is necessary to protect themselves or another person from imminent danger of death or serious bodily injury. 
One now, of the things that we like to teach our officers to keep it simple, and we teach the public as well, think of the word IDOL, I-D-O-L, in defense of life. I can use deadly force to protect my life, your life, or the life of the third party. And that's, that's the only time I'm justified to do yeah. that. Here recently, we did have an officer involved shooting. And I was going to show you, have any of you seen the, the video from that? Or have not seen the video from that? I'm going to kind of zip through some of it and just get to the main part. It's not graphic. It's not that bad. Um, darn, did I hear darn? <laughs> okay, so he contacts the person who called us in. And then he contacts, let's see if I can get this done without it jumping all over my, okay. So now this is the guy and he keeps dodging around the, the, the police Tell car. Me, don't do it. He keeps pleading with him. This goes on for probably yeah, several that. minutes. All he wants to do, when he first initially walked up to him, he was very calm, it was very low key. He said, Tell hey Calvin man, what's going on? And Calvin ducked back, put his hand in his pocket and kept doing this. It kept keeping it bladed to him. Like, so that's kind of a red sign, red flag to us. Calvin. And so he keeps ducking back and forth. That's all I want you to see right in. No. Stop saying that. He's man. asking if the you, officer's I ready. I want you to talk to you, man. He goes, are you ready? To you. Calvin, stop it, man. So you can imagine this officer's adrenaline is really rushing. Him, but he did an excellent job in trying to get talk to him Calvin, and get stop, him to man. work with him. And he keeps Calvin, he keeps ducking. It. Oops, sorry. Calvin. Does the officer have his gun drawn already? Yes, he has it down. I can't see. It's public record. Calvin, dude! Calvin, drop it! Drop it, man! Okay. Don't make me do this! So right here is when he pulls out what we thought was a gun, and you hear the shots. And that was, um, so it was that quick. He couldn't see it. He, he does this, and with all of that preemptive stuff, um, that gave him the authority to go ahead and make that shot. Now, unfortunately, and this is stuff that we have to live with, he had a cell phone. But he wanted us to believe, by, based on his actions, that he had something more. And later, we did interview this guy. He did not die. We interviewed this guy, and he was like, man, he did what he had to do. I mean, he, gave, he kind of justified that officer's actions, the, the guy that got shot. So, uh, let's see. <laughs> All right. Can I ask a question? Yes. The, where was the camera? I mean, right the camera is like right, right there. Okay. I forgot. I didn't put mine on there. Yeah, those, those are our body cameras. We, we've had these for a while. Um, yeah. if you, they're not perfect, but they're better than nothing. Yeah. There are several different placements you can have for these. They've got some that clip on your eyeglasses. Mm -hmm. They've got some that are shoulder mounts, and we wear our center of chest. Uh, for the most part, it does good, unless mm -hmm. I do this. And yeah. You can't see what I'm looking at or if I bring my hands up. But it, it gives an actual very good, uh, very good representation of what the what's in the officer's field of vision based on It just doesn't show exactly what you see. Because as soon as he went like this, yeah, well, it dropped, if, if the camera dropped. Just, again, when you go to bend over, the camera is now pointing down. And so that's kind of what. If you get behind cover, it, there's no perfect placement unless we can all have a drone that follows us around. <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah. But, but yeah, we could have the drone that flies above us like the NFL, right, like a football game, but it's just not possible. So we have cameras here. We also have cameras in all of our, our uh, police cars that record our, our traffic, our, excuse me, all of our marked police cars okay. that record our contacts. Okay. Yes. yes. It does. And then it's like it's a cell phone and everybody makes y'all look like the bad guys and you can't yeah. see it. When, when this came out, uh, if you didn't notice, Kelly kind of fast forwarded, <laughs> the officer asked, instructed, even begged him to stop doing what he was doing. And the whole time he pretended like he had a weapon. And this went on for several minutes. It was a, a very long exchange. Uh, and pretty much right after this happened, the chief came out, talked about it. As soon as we were able to release it, we released it. We got 
virtually no negative feedback from anybody. Everybody that saw that video said, do what you had to do. The guy's pretending like he's got a gun. We're at a disturbance call where there was a, a, a claim of violence where he was involved with. We, we had to do something. And if you think about it too, in, that, this is a classic example, and we call it suicide by cop. He wants us, it, it was one of those instances where he wanted us to take his life. Fortunately, that didn't happen, but he needs more mental health than he needs to be put in jail. And we try to identify those issues and we try to get them help if they need. Okay, yes, so. Just ask one quick question. Sure. Is there a difference between, you know, aiming to kill and aiming to just. Um, we, sure. And as a firearms instructor, I would love to, to answer <laughs> that for you. We don't shoot to kill ever. Um, I never teach any of my officers to do that. We, we shoot to stop you from doing something wrong. We, we shoot to stop an illegal act, okay? That, that's the only means we feel that we have to make you stop doing what you're doing. We shoot at the biggest target that you present us with, and that's typically center mass. That's where we shoot because, again, I don't want to shoot you 15 times. I want to shoot you once and get it over with. Hopefully, like as in this case, the gentleman didn't die. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you as a firearms instructor and someone who teaches other people how to teach people how to shoot, I can't shoot you in the hand. It's not possible. The stuff you see in the movies doesn't really happen because my adrenaline's up and you're moving. And there's houses behind you. There's, there's people there's maybe in those houses. Behind you. And the other thing is, even if I shoot you in the foot, that's deadly force. Every time I pull that trigger, it's deadly force, whether I shoot you in the foot or the pinky toe or the hand or the shoulder or in the forehead, it's deadly force. Every time I pull the trigger, if I miss, I'm shooting for you and I hit the gentleman behind you, that's deadly force, <clears throat> see? So every time I pull the trigger, I wanna hit what I'm aiming at. And so I aim for the biggest target that's, that's able to be struck. And again, I'm not shooting to kill, I'm shooting to get you to stop. Again, when this gentleman stopped reaching and acting like he was shooting, the shooting stopped. We didn't keep shooting. You, you do see that on TV sometimes, you see 37 bullets go down range. We don't teach that. As soon as the threat is neutralized, we reassess and we provide medical attention. Now, just to understand, too, though, is like he said, as soon as the, the threat ends, our brain takes a while to register that the threat is gone. And sometimes you will see an officer shoot multiple times after the guy's gone down, and it's because the brain hasn't registered yet. But, okay, so team one, it's y'all's turn again. Do another five. Clear out the bottom, make this easy. Which one? Which one? <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Okay. 500, all right. Name one of several community events the BPOA sponsors. Let me let, BPOA is our officers association. It's not necessarily, the, the Bryan Police Department also back behind it represented, but it's run by the officers association. Neighbors Night Out. Hmm? Neighbors Night Out. National Night Out. Uh, that is more a police sponsored function versus a officer outside association function. But that's a very good answer. So with the PD. <laughs> okay, that, that's also this, that's kind of the PD. Oh wait, lady in the back. Team three. No, that was sponsored by the city. Yes, there we go. Brian Police Citizens. Oh no 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 wait. Oh I'm sorry. I, that's police. Father Fish. Do y'all do that? We don't do that. Very close. Okay, well we're gonna go ahead and give. No, you know, we don't do the parades, but um, right. we're going to go ahead and go through it. We have Blue Angel. The Bryan Police Officers Association is an association of all the employees at the Bryan Police Department, and we get together to do things to give back to the community as a, as a vehicle. Um, and a few of the things that we do, Blue Angel, that, I mean, you've all heard of that. It's mm -hmm. our Christmas program. We adopt needy children and elderly. Um, we, we now assist with our Blue Bunny, which was a Bryan Police Department event. That we now help with our chaplains run it. Um, that's our Easter egg. It's a free hunt Easter egg hunt. Um, the last one down there is a Mark Hyatt scholarship. We had an officer killed in the line of duty back in the year 2000, and we've been raising funds ever since to put a scholarship in his name out for people in the community to remember Mark with. Uh, and last year we were able to hit our baseline amount, so we anticipate giving yep. out a scholarship in May of 2018. 
Uh, there's another one on there. It, um, well, wait, it's not on there, but it's not yes. It's on there, but we uh, we're just started our it. very first annual uh, golf tournament for charity <laughs> that we're doing, and that'll be coming up. Um, October 9th. October the 9th. So if any of you play golf <laughs> or know someone who does, please help us advertise. It's uh, brianpolicegolf.com. You have to type it in the top. They won't, you can't search it for some reason, but it's www.brianpolicegolf.com. But it's a way for, it's a 501c4 nonprofit organization. It's a way for the members of the Bryan Police Department to come together to go out in the community and help and give back and do some charitable work. <laughs> All right. So team two, it's your turn. Special Investigations 500. We're knocking out the bottom in one fell swoop. How many active gangs are currently in Bryan? And I don't even remember what the answer is, did you? About 200. No, <laughs> no that's a Not little bit. Yes, sir. No. Get closer. 13. Less. Six. Very good. I'll take that. Team two. Six. Right on the nose. And this is just, now, these are the major, major gangs. There are a few little cliques or groups, but we didn't want to include them in this number just because they're not really established very well. Yes. Of the six major gangs, how many do you think are involved? Do you have a number of individuals? We have a late note. I, I don't have access to my notes because I forgot to, to print them off, but um, our, we have a gang intelligence employee, or one of our officers is a gang intelligence. She does have record of all of that. I don't know what the number is, um, but this number includes like the Latin Kings, the Serenios, the Crips, the Bloods. And we had, I would say we had a major problem with our gangs um, 10 years ago, 07, 08, in that area. And we really cracked down on them. And we uh, started a gang injunction, which if we could document that they were in a gang based on multiple factors, then we could put a gang injunction, let's say, on John, and John couldn't be in a, at a house with other gang members. He could not have a cell phone in the front of his vehicle that he had access to call because they would call up their gang buddies and say, hey, I'm over here, so-and-so's here, let's do this. And so it, it put a lot of different rules on them. So if we stopped them and they violated any of those rules, we could arrest them for violating that gang injunction. And it dramatically decreased the violent activity that they were engaged in. We had a gang drive, when I was on night shift back in 06 or 07, we would work the drive-by shooting about once a week. And that was just my rotation. We worked 12 hour shifts. So in the two or three days I would work during the calendar week, we would have a drive-by shooting. Okay. What are some, can I say, what yep. are some of the identifiers? Like, especially like their age right. and right. older. It, it, you know, change, it changes frequently. It changes yeah. frequently, and, and a lot of the reason is because people become wise to their to their tricks. Mm -hmm. So it used to be they would all wear like a red shirt. Well, then after a while, everybody figured out everybody in a red shirt's a member of the gang over here. So they'd stop wearing red, and maybe they'd get a tattoo. Maybe they would blend something in that mm -hmm. tattoo. And then, well, now we figured out what their tattoo means, so they would change it to something else. It can be anything from the colors that they wear to how they wear them, like peg rolling one leg of your pants up and leaving the other one down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Certain one point it was the right socks. leg for one gang and the There's left so leg for the other. so many different little things. The yeah. biggest thing is they always like to advertise and we just have to figure out what it is. They'll mm -hmm. tattoo themselves up with a big clown mask on their shoulder. Yeah. Or they'll draw, well, like yep. when they're in junior you know, high or high school, so they'll draw. And we usually see it in the younger ones. The younger ones are usually the ones that like to advertise the most. The older ones like to be a little bit more low key. Yeah. They've uh, been through the system be a couple anything. times. So. It can be anything. Yeah. Really. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I went to school at um, Jane Long. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so nobody was allowed to jaw themselves because before that rule, people would come in and they have like ink symbols. Yeah. Like, Draw everywhere you can see. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. Okay. Do, do those two shootings that happened uh, last week, are they like Unfortunately, because they're still under investigation, we can't talk about those, so, other than what I've publicly released. <laughs> okay, so team three, I think, is where we're at. Do, do we get, yeah, we got that. Yeah, they got that. Okay, if I don't put the points up here, you got to let me know. Okay. I got one job. He gets busy talking. Terrible. He gets busy talking, and he forgets what he's supposed to do. <laughs> I get patrol for 400. Patrol, patrol for 400. 400. Going backwards, all right. I like it. 
Okay, what is the average number of calls for sh service a BPD, one BPD officer takes in one shift on average? Team three. Seven to nine. No. no. 13 to 15. No. No. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Team one, 11. Now, this is our zone map, if y'all can see it. Um, the city is split up in this configuration, so each zone is assigned to an officer. Now, that's if everyone shows up on a shift, you know, if they're not sick or on vacation or had school. Um, if they're, everyone shows up, we have 10 officers in, on like day team. And so they'll have one in each zone and they'll have two that rove. It doesn't mean they have to stay in that area. If something drops across town, they can still leave. But most of them are very territorial. And if a call comes out in their zone, they're gonna say, I got it, I'm almost done. You know, don't send another officer. So um, it's very good because they get to know those houses, they get to know the people in, that, in those areas, and they kind of see the same car at a house every, every day, so they get to uh, familiarize themselves with that. So on average 11, typically it's probably, you gotta think, one call can take five hours. So 11 is, although it doesn't seem like a lot for a 12 hour shift, it is because you've got one call, a DWI, I don't know how long it takes now, but when I was when I was on the street a long time ago, it took probably four to five hours to do one DWI accident. And a lot of it was because, or DWI arrest, was because, not an accident, but just DWI, because of the paperwork involved. We Because all the documentation that you have to do to go along with that. I think it's dropped some now because they've streamlined some of that paperwork. Um, an accident can take two hours. You know, if there's people at the hospital, it can take longer. So you gotta think, that's 11, but some of those, calls take several hours. Okay, so what, which one are we? Who's next? Oh, team one. Team one's next. Oh, general 400. General 400. Okay, there are three main ways that media gets their information. This is my job. Can you name one of them? Team three. Okay, I'll take it. I don't think that's on my list, but I will take it, because they do. They do. Team they don't on get it from me. Woo! Yes, team three's on the board. <laughs> okay, the three ways that I give them information is either through a press release. So, that's always going to give me this little message. So, I send out press releases on significant events. I sent out two today. We had a fatality accident this, uh, last night, and we had a, another shooting last night on a drug incident. Um, the victim was not, had minor injuries, he was just shot in the hand. Um, but he was dealing drugs when he got shot. So that's what I gave the media. <laughs> so this is what our press releases look like. Uh, if I update them and give them new information, I'll just put a little update and kind of highlight that form so they know what the new information is. Now, how many of you saw the story? Oh, well, here's another one. Significant activity report. They get this every morning. It gets, goes out on an email. You also have access to this. It is on our website. So at bryantx.gov slash police on the right-hand side it says significant events it will only post one day at a time so they're not they don't archive them uh, but I do so sometimes someone will call me and say hey do you have a significant activity report for this day and I'll, and I'll send it to them so that's another way and it has the actual address I only give out block numbers in my press releases they can actually get the exact address over here now how many of you saw the story about the girl uh, who got arrested for DWI after she was uh, Snapchatting and sending pictures of herself. Okay, that's this one, right? Okay, we got a lot of flack, I'm gonna tell you, for releasing this on our Facebook page. But I will tell you this, I did that because I wanted the true story to be out there because I was already getting calls from New York and Washington before I ever posted it. They get this photo, this is a public, I mean, anybody can get this. It's in Justice Web. Uh, so it's the Brazos County Sheriff's Office has a website where you can pull up mug shots from anybody who's arrested. So that is where they got that. They got off of the significant activity report. And then also there's a website that media has access to. Not everybody does, but it has all those probable cause statements. So this is the probable cause statement from that arrest, I believe. And so it gives them all those details. So that's where they get the fine details. The, the, the case that just happened on the, uh, which one was it? The Williamson Park murder. You saw the ad in the Eagle. They got all that information from here, okay? It's not because I tell them, it's because they got it from there. Um, I try to keep my information short and sweet. 
And if they want to release the other gritty, ugly details, that's up. That's on them. Okay. And then this is the website that they get those from, if it comes up. So this is what it does. It has each day. So, and it's from midnight the night before. So yesterday, these are the PC statements, and this is public information. So these people got arrested, and it won't have juveniles. Uh, they go to a different facility. But it'll have their name, what they were arrested for, and then right here are all the probable case, cause statements. That one's from College Station, another College Station, another College Station. Sometimes it'll be the same person, but they have multiple charges, so they'll be, it'll be the same PC report in there multiple times. Here's one of ours. Um, yes. yes. That is an excellent, excellent question. Excellent question. Um, what we do is the sheriff's office has is the one who typically puts holds on. If we are instructed by ICE to do so, we have to follow <coughs> that. We cannot not work with ICE. But we don't intentionally seek out ICE. We don't. Uh, we have a Spanish Citizens Police Academy, which is for people who are here illegally. So because they're victims, if we are going to go issue ICE warrants all day long they're never going to tell us that something's happening to them. And we treat them like anybody else in this community. We don't care what the status is. Does that answer your question? As, as a patrol officer, if I go out and I make a contact with somebody on a traffic stop, I do not inquire into their immigration status. Mm -hmm. I, if, if you're driving a motor vehicle, I have a right to check to see if you have a valid driver's license. Because in the state of Texas, you have to have a license to operate a motor vehicle. If while I'm running your driver's license, if they come back and say you have a warrant for your arrest, and I can validate that warrant, then I either shall or may make an arrest based on that warrant, and I have to take you to jail. That's all we do with immigration stuff for the most part. We don't go out and actively seek people out to ask them their status. I mean, we don't do the holds, actually, that's done at the sheriff's office. So if I arrested somebody for driving on a suspended license or driving while intoxicated, and I take them to jail, the sheriff's office is actually the ones that has to report that to immigration, and immigration would talk to the sheriff's office and say, yes, we have a detainer on this person, you need to hold him for a specific amount of time, and then we will come, we will make a, a decision on whether or not to come take him back for a, for a hearing. So we are not agents of ICE. I will tell you this, if ICE comes in and does something, and they need a police officer to go with them at their request, we have to go help, because it's protection for our citizens. Because if we have somebody in town that's not local that's knocking on doors and doing things, and you don't know who they are, how do you know they're a cop? But if you've got a Bryan police uniform and a Bryan car out front, at least you know they're legitimate law enforcement. So we go with them, but we're not, we're, we do that for any outside entity. College Station runs a search warrant, Bryan, we try to go with them. If a DPS runs one, we try to go with them. Okay? But no, we're not, at, we're not active in agents working with immigration. But if they do, like if College Station does a search warrant here, we're not going to go in and actually search with them. We're basically going to sit on the perimeter and make sure things go smoothly. Yes, Same place. Same place. I never knew that existed. Yes. <laughs> yeah, because that, that website I gave you has everyone who's arrested. So they get all of that and, and then they go and pick the yep. picture. Mm -hmm. You go yep. and type in their name, and it'll pop up their mugshot. Yep. Okay. For everybody that's an adult, non-juvenile. Yeah, non-juvenile. Yes, you got a question? I think both of you are. Why were they complaining about the girl's picture being up there? Yeah. I think a lot of it was because she was a teenager. They felt like she, you know, were ruining her life because it's made, I mean, it made national news. We, because she was driving she was, drunk, right? She was driving we, intoxicated. We put out that she was driving while intoxicated. Mm -hmm. The Somebody media. The media put out she was taking... Uh, inappropriate pictures of herself yeah. and she's a work. student at A&M and they put her picture up yeah. and so that got turned back on us which was how could you ruin this young girl's yeah. life look what you did you released all this information all we said was she was in a DWI accident where she rear-ended a police car well the PC statement did say that she admitted to the officer she was snapchatting to her boyfriend she never said what she was snapchatting but she was putting back her shirt on and her bra back so on. That, so that, that, they so made that assumption. So we put out limited information. Well the media got and extrapolated drinking. more data from the probable cause statement and put that out. And it really kind of made us look like we were the evil information yeah. people trying to make national headlines. And we're not. We yeah. just, there's certain things we have to report on. 
And that was one of the things when you have a police car in this truck. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So, uh, just follow up on the immigration question. Uh, huh? So, for sanctuary cities, do they not cooperate with ICE? Like, if they, the ICE is going to a house, do they not go with them? How See, I don't, I really I don't, don't know, know how, how they work. I know they're, they'll get in trouble if they don't follow yeah. ICE. There, there's a big battle the in, the, in the Senate right now, and, the Senate, yeah. and we're not involved with that. <laughs> we try to keep yeah. as far away from it as we so, can. <laughs> yeah. there, a lot of the sanctuary cities are saying we refuse to work with ICE at all, mm -hmm. and we're not going to honor their detainers, and that's and I think that's their jail that's saying that, right? That's the federal law. Yeah. So. Okay. Team two, it's your turn. Uh, criminal investigations from 400. All right. What is the average number of homicides in Bryan in a year? Not including this year, because I know we've been busy right now. <laughs> no. No. Is it five to six? No. no. Yes. Three to four. Team three. All right, team three catching up. Now, we have average, and that's an average over 10 years. We've had as high as five in one year, and we have had as low as, I don't remember if we had zero, but one in several years so that kind of made it right in the middle this year we had we were running on zero until september and now we've had two so <laughs> let's hope it stops <laughs> that's what we're praying for okay so uh, go. it's not going where i want it to Sure. Yes. Yes. Most, <laughs> it's either yes. drug related or domestic violence related. Yeah. I mean, we've had the only one I can remember in my 17 years that was not either one of those categories was two years ago, I think, when the Devlins were murdered. Yeah, that was oh, totally yeah. random. That's the one that you dread ha happening in your city. Um, well, and then the uh, there was one more, but he knew him. Uh, that was the um, West Westbrook. Yeah, Etta, Etta Jean Westbrook. She uh, she knew the person and had multiple conversations with him, but he was a neighbor. So those are the only two in my 17 years that I can think of that were not domestically related. And that was the house where they burned it down. That was no The Devlins. That was the Devlins. Yeah, where they burned it down. So, okay, team three. Special investigations, <laughs> All right. <laughs> what undercover stings might BPD use to combat street level crimes? Name two. Cindy. Oh, ah. I, I was going to say um, the drug stains mm -hmm. where they try to set up a drug thing. And then um, uh, kind of a similar thing with uh, burglary or uh, theft from a store. Like they'll, they'll go in and pretend to be a shopper, but they're keeping their eyes on You have half of it right. Drug and prostitution. There you go. There you go. Team three. They're catching up. Catching up. Oh, they surpassed the thing now. now. Okay. Drug buys, prostitution, online predators, and stolen property. Not kind of like what you're talking about. It's it's more of a, you know, maybe putting something we want them to steal. Um, or we've also had a pawn shop set up before where people brought us in stuff. And uh, we did a big sting a long time ago. That was probably early on when I was working here. And prostitution stings, we used to do a lot more of those. Now it's kind of gone to online. Um, stuff, but I, I have done a few of those, and uh, they were pretty interesting and fun. I'll tell you stories later. <laughs> Not in present company. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're back to team one. Four hundred community involvement. No good. Oh. Okay. Four hundred. Keep four hundred thing. How many schools have an assigned school resource officer in Bryan? Six. I gotta think because we just changed it. No. Very close. Very close. No. Very close. You got No. How many? Four. Oh, y'all are right in the middle. Five. Seven. Five. Yes, five was it. I think. Let me see. If I'm wrong, we'll, we'll reassign the points. Five. Okay. We did have six. We had six last year. Okay, but now because they realigned the schools and now we have intermediate and middle schools, we've realigned it. So now our um, two high schools have two officers in them, and our middle schools have one, and I think they have a rover that kind of goes around. Yeah, floaters for the so. and, oh, wait, no, we have one floater, and then one is at our uh, DAEP, which is uh, our alternative school for the kids who get in trouble and have to go take school over there. Okay, uh, who's next? Team two. Team two. 
300, criminal investigations. Yeah. Okay, criminal investigation division divides their crimes up into three categories. Can you name one? Yes. No. Kind of. Yeah, close. It's close. Forensics. Think more general. Think more general. All the Y'all are hitting inside of them. Fit in three categories. Yep. Trap, felony, assault, burglary, murder. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like <laughs> 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 um, Okay, if I if burglary, let, let's focus on burglaries. If I was burglary or stealing something, what would that fall under? What type of what type of um property? She got it right here. Property. We're good. Team one. Okay. I know we weren't very good with the help on that. So we have crimes against property, theft, burglary, uh, your white collar crimes. Uh, then we have crimes against persons, which is your assaults, uh, crimes against children, sexual assaults, all of that, and then major crimes, which are murder and our ag robberies. So like the convenience store ag robberies. Uh, some of the ag robberies where they go to someone's house and, and steal maybe drugs or something, that's going to fall under persons. You shouldn't be able to, allow, you shouldn't be able to use that word in this town. What? Ag. Oh, <laughs> sorry, that's, a, that's our, we abbreviate aggravated with ag, yeah. <laughs> I've caught myself on my press releases, I'll put ag, and then someone will say something, someone will call me, and I'm like, well, that's aggravated, okay? <laughs> All the ags are doing this, yeah. Um, okay, what team are we on? Team three. Team three. Over here. All right, patrol three. Okay. Okay. What decade was the first African American officer employed in Bryan? You were watching on the. No. No. Front row. Which one? So this, so this was this was a no. That was a no. You said eighteen seventy. That's a no. That's a no. Okay. Oh, wait. Yeah. <laughs> I think nobody gets that one because I don't want to. By default, 1800s. Um, let's see, do I have a link on here? Yeah, okay. Now, this officer was, that's Eidelberg, and he wasn't necessarily our first African American, but he has been kind of coined the first African American police officer because he was hired after we became Bryan Police Department. Prior to that, we were city marshals, and we had a marshal in the 1800s by Levi Neal who um, he worked a lot of the community. Back then there was segregation, I think, still going on. So he kind of knew all of the African-American community and he helped us with that. And he was killed by, uh, I think, if I remember correctly, it was in my notes. He um, arrested a man for being drunk and he was walking him to the jail and they killed him. And he had actually survived two previous shootings before. We had, we've had six officers killed in line of duty. Five of those were in the 1800s, uh, back in those days when it was all gunfire and stabbing. And then we've had one in 2000, which was a motorcycle accident. So it kind of shows what, how the community was a long time ago, that guns and knives were carried all the time. So is Neil as in Neil Recreation Center? Um, I don't it's think it was named same. after I him, but it may, it, I don't know if it's the same family or not. That's a good question, though. It would be kind of neat if we could link it to that. So, what team are we on? Team one. Team, yeah, team one. Okay. Which one did you want? Okay. Um, yes. Special investigations? Mm -hmm. Okay. Other than marijuana, what are the most common drugs in Brazos County? Okay. Correct. I don't think that was... No. Nope. was it? You, <laughs> Look at him. He's just throwing it out there. <laughs> I'm gonna let you be the judge. He said it. Huh? Yeah. Meth, said it. meth and ecstasy. Yeah. Crack was. Crack used to be. It has recently been bumped down right below these two. Yeah. So this methamphetamine. Is, and we, and again, we did this on a countywide level mm -hmm. because it's really hard to pinpoint because a lot of narcotics know no boundaries. No crime, crime doesn't so know. So it's it's those are probably when we asked our narcotics officers that those are the first two they talked about it was meth and MDMA ecstasy. So okay, good try though. All right, uh, team two. Okay, let's do community involvement for three, please. Three hundred. Okay. 
Bryan Police Department has a mascot that attends children events in a dog costume. Can anyone give me his name? Nope. nope. <laughs> Look at the I hear something. Should be on the front. I don't even know what kind of breed he is, but he's got a name. No. This may take a while. All right. Five, four, three, two. All right. Y'all are showing your age if you say I should have put a picture up here. It should be on the front page. We, we used to use McGruff way back when we were younger. Right? That's more of a county mascot. Yeah. County uses him still. Now we use, we use Safety Pup. He goes out to a lot of our community events, national night out, kickoff party at Target. Probably yeah. there. Goes to things like that. It's it's really to engage to in really the library when they do the, things. The younger the kids. Okay. Um. What team? I forgot. Three. Three. Yeah, three. three. Team three. <coughs> <laughs> we have five different extra duty assignments, and we've told you several of them that we volunteer for. Can you name at least one? Red shirt. Oh. Honor guard. Honor yes. guard. Awesome. Okay. We have SWAT, which is we call it TRT, which is ta uh, Tactical Response Team. We have the CNT team, which is our Crisis Negotiations Team. Honor Guard, Mobile Field Force, and we also have a Critical Incident Stress Management Team. And what that one is, is I'm on that one as well. I didn't put that on my PowerPoint. But um, the critical incident stress management team is for, like, if you have officers that go to the death of a child or, you know, something where they had to, they, they did CPR, they didn't, it, the child didn't survive. It's very traumatic, even for us. And so this allows us to go, we work, like, if, if it happens here, College Station will come and do the critical incident stress management with us. And if it happens at College Station, we will go handle theirs because we don't want... You know, he doesn't want to tell me all his personal inside feelings because I know him too well. So if it's an outsider or a stranger, they're more likely <laughs> they're more likely to talk to us. So we are also protected uh, through court systems if there's something illegal that happened, not illegal, but if there's something questionable that happened and they're going to get, take them to court, I am actually covered and don't have to talk, tell them what he said to me. Like attorney. Yeah, client. kind of client right. privilege. So, yeah, yeah, so Officer James with Special Olympics. Yes. That, um, no. Okay, no, he that does that completely on his own. That's all on his own. Okay. Yeah. That's he. he that's he's his. Fall in love with that, and he runs with it, and he organizes it for the county. Mm -hmm. I don't know how he does it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you something interesting. Is he got into that? My stepmother, it was a Special Olympic coach, and she did the. Um, she traveled with the kids and took them to like bowling tournaments and stuff out of town. Well, that's how he got started was she invited him to come with her one time as a chaperone for the males. And so he fell in love with it. And so he has been, and we've adopted it too, like with the, the torch run. And matter of fact, I had my torch run shirt on this morning. He's on the buddy walk poster. Yeah, the buddy, buddy walk, walk poster, yeah. He, he's, a, he's the supervisor over our neighborhood enforcement team, we call it NET. <laughs> Because if you're in police work and you don't have a three-letter acronym in front of your name, you're not really anything. You're not really uh, but he's over net, which is neighborhood enforcement. They do a lot of community relations, and so that's one of the things that he does, kind of sort of through his office, is is they do those things again, promoting the police department out in the community. They do neighborhood events, national night out, those types of things. But yeah, that that's his passion, his drive. I don't know how he does. Bless him for doing it. We all. Most we, of I us do it work too. It and love it. We do tip a cop every year. It, so. and it's a lot of work. So. Okay. okay. Team one. I believe it's y'all's turn. Um, 200, criminal investigations. Criminal All investigations. Right. 200. How long does it take for a detective to complete their investigation? This is kind of a trick question, so think about it. How long it takes? Oh, she got it. <laughs> as long as it takes. So it does some, I mean, it's not like TV where they, the, someone is killed, the crime scene comes out, they run fingerprints and DNA and ballistics and all of that and wrap it up in 60 minutes, less with commercials. So um, it can take years. I mean, um, we've had back a long time ago before DPS streamlined some of their um, forensic uh, things, we would have a sexual assault kit go and it would take literally 
over a year, a year and a half to get that results back. So I think they have streamlined it now to about six months, but it still takes a long time to get some of that stuff back. We have some murder cases that are still open. So we're, I mean, they've been open for several years. Okay. Community Sick. involvement for 200. Community involvement 200. What can you do to help police recover your stolen property? <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Record your serial numbers. Mark and engrave them. I can't stress this to you enough. Um, and I might give up one of the other answers, but also lock your cars. Please lock your cars. I've been stressing this over and over and over again, and people still leave their cars unlocked. 90% of our burglary motor vehicles, someone left their own car unlocked. A lot of our stolen guns out of unlocked cars or left in cars, even if they're locked, they left them in their car. And they, they got them taken. How many of so. y'all know your serial numbers? How many of you logged them? Why aren't your hands going up? Hey, in it. the digital age, it is so easy. Mm -hmm. Take your cell phone, snap a picture of it. You can download them to a thumb drive. You can keep them at work. You can take, you can actually print the pictures out if you want. It is so easy. As a police officer, when I respond to you, hey, my house got broken into and they stole my TV. Well, what was it? Well, the TV is black. It's not that true. <laughs> I can't help you. Yeah. But We're never going to get it back. If you a serial number, if that thing shows up at a pawn shop, immediate hit if they, if they use our leads online. Yeah. If I make a traffic stop and I got a guy with eight TVs in the back and it doesn't say like Aaron's Rena Center on the side, I know there's probably a problem. I might be able to run a serial number and find your stolen stuff. Little funny story on the side. How many y'all know who Vaughn Miller is? Know Vaughn Miller? Yes. Yeah. Okay. When Vaughn Miller was a youngster in AM, we were working a call one night and we found a guy on a bicycle. We ran and, and we knew it wasn't his. We flipped the bike over, we run the serial number, we don't find anything. And on the down tube of that bike was engraved VM58. Back then, nobody knew who he was. But we were able to track that back to A&M get his bicycle back. So just that little bitty stuff right there makes a huge difference. Okay, just owner applied numbers, serial numbers make a huge difference. So what please, about cameras? cameras, cameras. They've all the got them on there. Cameras. Was that you that put out something about Ring.com? Oh, that was uh, Nextdoor.com. Is uh, why since you brought that up, um, our net. Uh, department kind of runs our end of nextdoor.com and Melinda Fox she puts most of the the post on there she put that one I also every now and then put some stuff on there uh, like I think I put the golf tournament on there and some other things so yeah the ring that's a um, security cameras to help and and that's another way that y'all can help is if people have security cameras at your house if you'll call us and log say hey I do have security cameras at this address if someone gets burglarized next door I guarantee that the burglar walked up in your to your car and tried your doorknobs. So, and we have a lot of that. We'll, we'll get a burglary that happened down the road and then someone else says, hey, this guy just came and tried on my door, but they didn't break into it because they locked it. But we now have video of someone that was pulling on door handles in that neighborhood and that helps our investigation. So, um, but Leads Online, he mentioned that. You can also access Leads Online. It's, a, it's an online tool. You can record your serial numbers in there, upload photos of it. And then that way, if you come over to the police department to to do a report that all of this stuff got stolen, you can log in the leads online, you check everything that got stolen and you hit print and it will print us out a list. So it's very handy, I, I looked into that. And we don't have access to your information, although we use leads online for the law enforcement purposes. Okay. <laughs> all right, who's next? I've, I've lost track. Team three? Team two or three? Team two, that's right, she, she, was, the, she was the last one. Go ahead. Special Investigations 200. If someone is being held hostage, what unit out of those voluntary units would the police department call to assist? No. Crisis. There you go. Very good. Crisis negotiations. We would call SWAT. SWAT does. But the hostage part of it, we would call out crisis negotiations so yeah. they can set up a form of communication with the hostage taker. They'll get They'll activated to first. Them to come out. Yeah. The SWAT team can be hiding in the bushes. Yeah. Because someone's still going to call that person before we ever even get the van set up. We want someone on the phone with them. Because if they're, if they're engaged with us, they're not engaged with the people they're with. 
So the more we can keep them on the phone, we can keep them distracted away from the people that they have hostage. Are there any hostage situations? Not many. Most of them are domestic violence situations. Like So it's someone who wants to hurt themselves or they're, they're mad at the world and, and they've, they've done something so that they're going to go to jail for and now they don't know how to get out of it. And that's all we do. We try to give them an avenue to get out without well, hurting anyone. Since I've been here, most of the ones that we've been in what we call a barricaded person, mm -hmm. that means they lock themselves up in a room and they don't want to come out. A hostage is when you take somebody in there unwilling and they're with you, right? Yeah. Most of the time they're in there by themselves. And we'll still try to establish communication with them and get them to talk somebody out, get them to come out of their own free will, rather than us kicking a door and going after them. Because yeah. that's usually when bad things happen. Unfortunately, sometimes that's what we have to do, but we'd much rather talk to somebody and have them come out on their own free will. And we've had several instances where they're barricading themselves, they don't want to come out, and their loved one won't come out because they want to stay in there and help them. And sometimes it leads to more issues. So. Okay. We've got about five minutes right. to go. Team three, I believe. Control for 200. Uh, oh. Oh. oh, sorry. Oh, it's up there. Okay, sorry. We'll, we'll do there. the other one next. Okay. When applying to become a police officer, what is the number one reason an applicant gets disqualified? Dang, she's was she first? Did you did you know it? I said convicted, but I don't know. <laughs> no, she's lying. Lying. She got it right. Lying. lying is the number one reason because we ask you to fill out this 200 page or 200 question questionnaire. Then they you come into a preliminary interview they ask you a whole bunch of more questions that are very detailed some of them are very embarrassing and someone will lie about it um, one of the cases and I asked our recruiter what some of the weird cases she had she had one that applied with us who had plotted to murder someone he um, I think someone had done something and so he got with someone else and says hey we're gonna go back to his house I'm gonna lure him out of the house and you shoot him the guy was hiding in the bushes our applicant knocked on the door, and the guy opened the door this much, went and talked to him, shut the door. So thank God he did that, because otherwise he would have been probably convicted of murder, and he thinks he can get a job with us. Uh, we've had some people, very little minor things, um, would be working at a car wash place, and they steal the loose change out of people's cars as it goes through the car wash. I mean, that's minor, but if I can't trust you with loose change, I'm not going to trust you with somebody's money when you're taking them to jail. So, um, and they'll lie about it, and then when it gets polygraphed, they're like, oh, well, there was this one other time. <laughs> There's always one other time. <laughs> yeah, and if they're going to lie on an interview, we don't want them with us. It doesn't mean if you do something wrong, you won't get hired, because plenty of us have done something wrong. It's just a matter if you're big enough to admit it. Oh, yeah, patrol for 200, because that one, because I messed up. I gave you free. How many canines does the Bryan Police Department currently have, and can you name at least one of them? And this information has changed recently, so we'll see. Three, two, or three. Which is it? Pick two one. Or three. 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 Two. 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I, I am going to give them. Oh, I forgot the name. Okay, that's all right. We'll get to it. We did actually have three, so that's why I want to give it to them. But one of them um, got a little aggressive, so we had to repurpose that dog. Uh, but we have Blitz, which is a Belgian Malinois. <laughs> this he's is not a, that cute. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know when he's running at you. Yeah, so uh, this is Blitz. He's one of our newer dogs. Uh, we've had him for two years now, I think. Um, and then Khan. Now, this is a video. This is some of the things that they can do. It's a really cool video. And some of them are our older dogs. And I can't, the music's not on it, but. So they have a prey drive, a cur that we give them a courage test. <laughs> this is one of our dogs. This is Khan. That was one of our former dogs. That's one of our dogs right there. Wow. Is he so cute now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now that, that type of stuff is very rare, but most of it's the drug sniffs that we do. As I was explaining, as I was explaining to the people in the front row earlier, we our dogs are we call them patrol dogs. Ah, They're fine. trained to do a lot of different things. They can do narcotics detection. They can do uh, tracks of people. They can do article recovery, and they can do a little bit of takedown work if we need them to. Again, as we talked earlier about that, what do we have to do to be justified to use deadly force? 
we have to meet some of those things before I can deploy a canine because of the damage they can do. We can muzzle them up and send them in, and then when that bowling ball of muscle hits you, it's going to hurt. We can take the muzzle off and they can latch on if they have to. So it depends on the crime. It's not like you litter outside your window and we're going to deploy the dog after you, right? <laughs> uh, it's got to be something very serious. Okay, with that being said, it is 1 o'clock. If some of you have to get back to work, you're free to go. We can still finish it up if y'all want to. Um, I don't know if y'all have any schedules. But before you go, but we want to, yes, we have some. I freebies. got free stuff up here. Everybody's a winner. Yeah, everybody's a winner. Thanks for playing. We got cups and stuff, so come on up. So if you have to leave, please come up and get something. If not, we'll continue on because there's a tie, and we, I think we need to break it. Mm -hmm. All right. And there's still a chance for Team One to come back. Yeah, Team One. So. Someone has to be an active aggression, like wanting to fight us or wanting to hurt us before we can. So thank y'all for coming. We really appreciate it. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Go ahead, take a cup. They're great. We could use that against someone. Rinse them out before you use them. Keychains, magnets. Thank y'all so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Uh, what team are we on? Uh, I don't know. Well, all team three left. Well, so team two is left. left. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> all right. Well, we'll run through these real quick just so y'all can see them. Uh, General 100. When an elderly or child goes missing, what alert do we put out? Amber alert and silver. Yes, Amber and silver. We're not doing points now. We're not doing points? We're going to have climbing back in the game. All right. What is the most important thing you can do when stopped by a police officer? Yes, be courteous. Be courteous. We, we put this little video together. Our, our wonderful communications department over here put this together. WTAW news time is five minutes after seven. It's 67 degrees. We'll take a look at your forecast coming up after the news. Good morning, I'm Chelsea Reber. The Brazos County Elections Office has finished its review of a petition drive for a public... <laughs> Don't pull over in the middle of a road or stop in heavy traffic. Pull over onto a side street or parking lot as soon as it's safe to do so. After you pull over, roll your windows down, and if it's night, turn on your interior lights. Keep your hands visible and wait for the officer to ask for driver's license and insurance before you reach for them. Good afternoon, ma'am. My name is Officer Christian with the Brown Police Department. The reason you're being stopped today is because you're speeding. Our clock you going 42 miles per hour in a 35 mile per hour zone. Is there a particular reason for your speed? No, but I do have to go to the bathroom. You gotta go and, to the bathroom? Yeah, like right now. Okay, all right, if you just give me your driver's license and your entrance, I'll make this as quick as possible. Um, okay, well, I'm, I hope it's quick. You wouldn't believe some of the excuses we hear on traffic stops. It's best just to be honest with the officer. No, sir, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, that's perfectly fine. Do you mind if I see your driver's license and insurance, please? Yeah, of course. Oh, and uh, I, I Drop have the a gun! gun. If you have any weapons in the car, tell the officer and do not reach for them. And just to let you know, sir, I, I do have a handgun. I'm a licensed gun carrier, and uh, it's, in, it's, in, it's in the console. Okay. Um, but just, just to let you know, I do have it. All right, thank you for letting me know that. Just do me a favor, don't reach for it and keep your hands on the steering wheel, okay? All right, ma'am, so this is going to be your citation for speeding. Uh, why? All right, ma'am, I just need you to sign right here on the X. By signing, it's not an admission of guilt. It's just a promise that you'll appear before the municipal court. With so the why do I have to status. sign it? It's just a promise that you'll appear before the municipal court. Do you have any questions for me? No, but I wasn't speeding. All right, ma'am. Here goes your citation. It is best to be courteous during a traffic stop. If you are issued a ticket, now is not the time to dispute the charge. If you feel the charge is unjustified, contest it in municipal court. All right, ma'am, so this is your citation for speeding. I just need you to sign right here on the X. By signing, it's not an admission of guilt. It's just a promise that you'll appear before the municipal court within 10 business days. Do you have any questions for me? No. 
All right, ma'am, you be safe, okay? Okay. The Bryan Police Department conducts traffic enforcement to help make our community's streets safer. Following these simple guidelines make traffic stops less stressful for all of us. For more information, visit our website at www.bryantx.gov slash police. Bottom right. Bottom right. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you don't know what's going to pop up there. Sure. Yeah, I don't know. No, there was something down here, I thought. It won't. Come on, there we go. Okay. Ah. Okay. So, um, how many of you heard that we do traffic enforcement to for revenue? Yeah. To, make money. to make money. We we pull you over to write you a ticket. Yeah, to meet a quota. Money. Yeah. 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 <laughs> None of that is true. Uh, one, it's illegal for them to put a quota on us to uh, tell us how many cars we have to get or how many people have to give citations to. Um, and two, very little of that, that revenue goes into a general fund and very little of it comes back to the actual police department. It goes none for general. It. None of it? Okay, none. see, she even knows better. None so of it comes back. I can tell you about that real quick. <laughs> so for every citation that's issued when there's a finding of guilty or a plea of guilty, the first $93.50 goes directly to the state of Texas. They have all these court costs. They assess. They get their money first. So very little of that money actually stays in Brian, and what does stay in Brian goes in the general fund. It does not go back to the police department. It does not go back to the court. And for those of you who don't know, this is Mary Lynn Strada, city secretary. So I, that's one of my pet peeves is that we do all the work and the state gets all the money. That's a pet peeve of mine, so I'm sorry I interrupted. No, 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 it's okay. Ninety three fifty. You remember that when you get a hundred dollar ticket? Zero. It's zero. <laughs> I, I'll tell you, I get that question all the time. I do a lot of lecturing in high schools and stuff. And 16 year olds, first thing they go, how fast can I drive without getting pulled over? The answer is, it depends. If you're in a school zone and there's kids present, my tolerance for your lead foot is going to be about that much. If it's a 25 mile an hour zone, you might get by with 26 or 27, and that's about it. Because why do we have that zone in place? Okay, if you're out on the highway and there's nobody around, I'm not going to stop you for two over when you're talking at 70 mile an hour zone. Each officer, though, has their own discretion, their own window of where they stop. Mm -hmm. yeah. At one point in time, we had it written in the policy, a, a flat line, we could not stop you unless you were exceeding this number. But we took that out because of reasons like that over by St. Joe's Hospital where the construction zone is active, right? We're going to have a lot less tolerance in those areas than we will on the middle of Highway 6. I'm not saying you can speed on Highway <laughs> 6. But I will tell you this, that the people who build roads are very smart. And when they go in and they throw a number up on a white sign, they don't just throw a number up. That sounds good. They look at the road conditions, the entering roadways, the drainage, the slope, and the curb, and the amount of traffic to determine what a safe operating speed is. And the is. surface road. Uh, and that road. speed limit that says 70, that's not a permission slip to drive 70. That's if all conditions are optimal. If you remember, if you've been driving for a while, the speed limit sign used to say 70 and 65, yeah, or 60 yeah. and 55, and there was a nighttime speed limit because at night you never went out driving the headlights. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't pay attention to that. So the best thing I can tell you is keep it within a reasonable <laughs> tolerance of that speed. If you're plus or minus a couple miles an hour, you're probably not gonna have a problem unless you're in a school zone or a construction zone. So. And to give another little example behind that is, let's say it's a 40 mile an hour zone in the center of the city. You're going 40, but it's raining and it's wet and you rear end someone. That's why you get a, that's why your citation is going to say fail to control speed. It doesn't say you're speeding because you were going 40 miles an hour. You were going the speed limit, but it's because of the conditions that you were going 40, you couldn't control yourself. Ice, darkness, she, rain she's had a question for. So two questions. Sure. So you were saying there's no cap on the numbers. So the, I'm assuming that applies to the motorcycle policemen that are on the. Zone True. That's correct. I like that. But That's that correct. is one of their objects. Is yes. Looking for speeding when Lynn is going in and out. Their, and their and main job in life is to gain voluntary compliance through selective enforcement, and that's a big, big way to say they go out there and periodically show up to keep you on your toes so that you pay attention. Yeah. Because we want people to slow down and follow traffic laws when we're not there, 
We don't want it to always be, oh, there's a cop, I'm gonna slow down. Everybody does that, right? Sure. That even mom does that, right? Driving down the highway, there's a cruiser on the side of the road. You're laughing, it happens to you. Sure, you got your cruise control set at 70 and a 70. You top a hill and there's a state trooper, and the first thing you do is step on the brake. Why? It's been ingrained into you your whole life. Slow down. <laughs> I pass and my wife looks at me and says, I hope you're not speeding. What? <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's a natural reaction. But we want you to slow down when we're not there. Yes, we deploy in our high uh, traffic, traffic accident accidents. locations. We've got several areas around town that have been identified as high accident. Like 700 Villa Maria, right in front of HEB. We right deploy in front of those quite a Wells bit. Fargo. We deploy which, it around Blinn uh, because volume of traffic and a lot of collisions in that area, especially on WJB and Nash, by the post office. And also we try to hit as often as we can, all the schools in town, the elementary schools and things like that, when the school zones are active. And then if we identify a problem, periodically you'll see our speed trailer go out. We have a little trailer that we can park on the side of the road with a big billboard that shows your speed and how fast you're going. No, it's not a game. <laughs> That's supposed to drive by and see how, how big the numbers can get. It's so that we can, it actually has a counter on there so we can determine the volume of cars and how many of them are speeding. And then we can deploy an officer out there as well. Because yeah. so. sometimes people call and complain about speeding in an area and it's truly not a problem is that they've perceived that it's a problem. And so that's why they put the speed trailer out to kind of get those answers. You, get speed off <laughs> you don't want them. Yeah. Local area traffic management. You do not want them. I'll just, I'm going to go right there. Because we have little kids. Correct. And, and our block isn't a dead end, but it is a dead yes. end. Yes. Speed bump means, in plain language, that I have to slow down for the six inch strip of pavement. Guess what I do between the speed bumps? How many of y'all in, in a parking lot that's got speed bumps go five miles an hour and stay the whole speed all the way through the parking lot? <laughs> you don't. What do you do? You slow down and go over the bumps and then you step on the gas and you run up to the next one and then you step on the brake and then you go over that bump and you just keep going back and forth. Now they're doing that in front of your house and it's an engine rev brake, engine rev brake. Instead of what you want people to do is slow down. Now they're slowing down here and then speeding up. <laughs> if I knew the answer to that, I'd be a million. <laughs> what are those things uh, called you throw across? <laughs> spike strips. <laughs> Random um, spikes. There's, there's, there's other ways that they can do that for uh, traffic design, <laughs> traffic flow. If you notice, some of our some of our streets now have circles, mm -hmm. and, or they can they can bend a roadway to make it where you have to slow down a little bit. Uh, but speed bumps are not not the <laughs> answer that you're looking for. Everybody wants them. I, I know I hear it all the time. It's not really the answer. Okay. I heard a rumor that there's going to be some golf in the future. I've heard that rumor. I'm hoping that it's not there. <laughs> they're actually not speed bumps. They're speed bumps. Well, there's, and there's two different things. Yeah. There's, there's speed bumps and speed humps. They accomplish basically the same thing. There's speed, there's speed humps by Bryan High School over kind of on the aquatic center side where the tennis courts are. They have yeah. speed humps. They're also a, like a raised walkway for a crosswalk. They're, they're just wider. They're, they're wider. wider. It's the kind of same thing. Mm -hmm. You still hit them fast. Yeah. They're, they're great in concept, but they create a speed up, slow down effect through, between the speed bumps. Yes, ma'am. Is it just like beyond annoying when you're driving down, let's say, Highway 6, and somebody in front of you is like, oh crap, it's a cop. I better go <laughs> like five miles on the speed yes. limit, and you have to sit behind them? Yes. 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 I was just but if they're pulled over I, on the side of the road, you have to slow down. That's correct. Below the She's speed. talking about it. We're yeah. following we're behind them. We're just driving, but yeah. yes, if they're on the shoulder. And they do the panic, like, oh my God. And then yeah, they go like five miles an hour. Slow down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. I just it, it, does, it, it does. It does. It does. Only when I have to get somewhere. Like if I'm going to a call. Sometimes I'll run radar moving at 65 and a 70, and I'm sure I'm doing the same thing to people behind me who don't want to pass that cop that's driving under. Speedman, but guess what? Yes. It's okay to pass the cop, right? As long as you're going to speed I don't have my lights on. Okay. So what is the law that she was talking about? The move over law. It's 45. If you're stopped on the shoulder, police car, stopped yep. on the shoulder with someone else or whatever, and you're going to pass in the next lane, 
Does it have to be 45? So it's 20 yeah. under. It's 20 under. 20 under the or post is the lane. Uh -huh. Or if there's another lane, you have to move over. Yeah. Move over if you can or drop 20. Yeah. Yes. No, no. I want to ask you about um, cell phones. I'm sure we're going to get to that. But I was, sure. um, I run, and I have never really been concerned about traffic until, like, more recently. Mm -hmm. I know it's quite a bit of distraction. Um, there was a change in the, I know we have yes. a statute, that, or, and then the state made a law, and then I was about undoing the statute. What is the well, we don't have the city ordinance, because oh, it was oh, called, Station has a city okay. ordinance. And the new, the state law that just came out is no texting and driving. It's not no phone use. It's no texting and driving. And I will tell you this: there's no teeth to this bill. It's going to be very hard for us to enforce it. Yeah, that's what I'm going to enforce that. And the but only way is just hands-free totally. Like you can't college station's hands-free, but it, yeah. their but city ordinance doesn't comply all the way with the state law. So now they're going to have to redo their law. So that's what that's about. So how do you enforce this? You don't. Good question. <laughs> so the way it's the way it's written yeah. is you cannot text text while driving or use any type of electronic communication. So that includes emails mm -hmm. and things of that nature. I'm assuming that also means social media like Facebook, because you're actually entering words. Right. Um, you can't do that while you're driving. If you do, I can pull you over. I can write you a citation. You can still use your portable device for navigation purposes. You can still make phone calls. Yeah, so I'm typing in the address. On a See, mobile, you, on a you map. You can do things like that. <laughs> um, it, that's that's the way the bill's yeah. written, and that's what we have to work with. And we can't ask to see your phone. That's correct. Do you see? Do you, are you seeing more accident related with my cell phones? I mean, accident related with cell phones or not? I'm going to really throw something yeah. else out there. I'll call it distracted driving. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if it's a cell phone. Right. It doesn't matter if it's somebody in the back seat that won't sit down. Uh, it doesn't or keep their seatbelt on. Double or, meat, bacon, cheeseburger. Yeah. Are you driving with your knee? It's distracted driving. I've seen <laughs> ladies putting makeup on. I've seen mm -hmm. eyeliner going on in that rear mirror while they're driving. You're a sharp implement next to your eyeball while you're driving. I've seen. Cur uh, I, I will tell you, I did that when I was in, in when, when I high school, and I poked my eye with the mascara brush, and I still I have problems to this day. My with daughter, when she was turning 16, the salesman we're looking where the cigarette lighter port was there's a 110 plug you know what i'm talking about like yeah. in your house yeah and the salesman i said oh that's kind of interesting 110 he goes yeah you can curl your hair while you're driving and i looked at him i said uh, you, you just told a 16 year old girl she can use a curling iron while she's driving a car and he goes oh uh oh and he just kind of stopped and then his next question so what do you do for a living <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah distracted driving is bad yeah. some people can handle it better than others. Some people just changing the radio station or off in the bar ditch. So we, we try to encourage people not to use anything that would distract. We're all guilty of it. Almost yeah. every, my mother is probably guilty of it, right? Of texting while driving or answering the phone. The best thing you can do is just pull over if it's that important. And all the technology out there that's available, even if your car is older where it doesn't have Bluetooth in the dash and all that kind of stuff, you can buy aftermarket parts for that, or you can get a Bluetooth headset, or just set the phone in the cup holder and hit speaker. Just something simple like that can save your life or the life of somebody else. Or now you can download the app Safe 2, the number 2, Save, and if you have that activated on your phone, it won't ring or text messages won't come through, but it'll send a message saying that you're driving, and you get points towards food and beauty health products and all that kind of stuff in town. Trump the law or the ordinance that College Station passed, and so now that's, that's going to be a great question yeah. for the city of College Station. I believe it will, yeah. but that's for them to decide because, again, the state can make laws and the city can make laws, and right now they're trying to figure out which one's going to supersede. Right. The reason they did that is because it could get kind of confusing. As you drive from Bryan to College Station, I did it. Got to go. Hit College, College Station. Station. Yeah. Right? Uh, and so people would have to make that decision, especially if you're not from here. And cities can always... You're just driving through and you don't know, so there's there's all kinds of different things that can get very confusing. They wrote the state law to eliminate confusion, but we got what they wrote, so we'll, we'll deal with what they wrote. Now. Cities can always be more restrictive than the state. We can't be less restrictive than what the state says, but we can always be more. And all we right. still have signs let's, up in our school zones as well. Let's look at these next questions. Get out of my way, Bono. <laughs> on average, how many cases does a detective have at one time? Yes. 
Close. Close. Nope. 20 to 30. There you go. 20 to 30. 20 to 30. That's a lot. That's a lot at one time. At one time. Um, when I was a detective, I probably carried, when I was a white collar detective, I had more. I'd probably had close to 100 because maybe 10 of them were related. They were all the same victim, but different stores that they hit. So, and you had to get a case number for every store back then. I don't know if we, they're still requiring that or not. But, um, so yeah, 20 to 30, and that's, that's still a lot. So, uh, unfortunately, sometime, like when they get a case, they have three days to contact the victim. And then if it's something that you don't have a lot to follow up on, and I ran into this on some of my cases, I didn't have anything to follow up on. It wasn't gonna go anywhere. I knew it wasn't gonna go anywhere. It kind of got put on that back burner, and I worked on the ones that were like, when I was a sex crime detective, a kid got touched. I'm working on that one. You know, and I'm gonna put this other one on the back burner because I'm not gonna be able to prove it. I just gotta go through the motions and get everything through before I can dismiss it, so. Um, okay, special investigations. What is the worst for you physically, marijuana or K2 in spice? What do you know? What do you know? Very true. Very good. You do know. You do know. <laughs> uh, synthetic, although we don't advocate any of it, synthetic drugs are so much worse because they're laced with chemicals that you don't know what it is, and it will alter you in very uncommon ways. You, you, and the bad thing is, is so sometimes they'll take the like the ground up spice stuff and they spread it out and they spray this chemical on it. Well, this batch may get 10 times more potent than this batch. So when they bag it up, you take a hit off of one of them, you're fine, no effect. You take a, one off the next one and you're dead. So we've had several synthetic drugs. It's not just marijuana. They're starting to do um, synthetic ecstasy and, and synthetic uh, meth, right? Heroin. Heroin, maybe. Yeah, so, I mean, all of those are so much worse, and we've had a couple of deaths related to synthetic drugs. Again, not that we're saying go out and smoke weed. No. They're yeah. both bad. But people think it's a safer alternative, and it's not. Okay, what crime is the easiest to help prevent? And I mentioned this earlier. Yes. Car burglaries. Car burglaries. Lock is, your car. Are those increasing? Or is there just more information? Because on nextdoor.com, I know it's yeah, happening it's all right the time. All right, so At one time, it happened. To a neighbor yeah. nearby, and I went out to the car. It's like we put a GPS in there for God to lock the car. <laughs> yeah. just in the dash. Yep. I One think night we didn't lock the door. It was gone. I think what happens more is it's hitting your neighborhood now. Whereas I, our numbers have pretty much kind of fluctuated. Actually, have gone down since 2009. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit on the rise right now. But some of it's because this year it's all targeted over in these two, three neighborhoods. Right now, it's in your neighborhood. So you think or see that, oh my gosh, we're having this rash of burglaries, which we may be having that in your neighborhood. 2008, 2007, 2009, our crime numbers were very high. As Kelly mentioned earlier, we were talking about the gang stuff. We put it in conjunction. Now, we did a lot of different things in the 08, 09 time frame. And we took our crime numbers and literally reduced them by about two thirds, especially our burglaries and stuff. And we enjoyed that, that downward slope. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I until, gotta stop uh, him somehow. Until last year, <laughs> and then they started going back up. And there's a couple different reasons for that. Um, if we knew the exact reason, again, we'd be millionaires. Um, but a lot, we are getting more reports of it now. People are paying more attention to it now. Uh, we've got a lot more advertising out there about lock it, hide it, leave it. Billboards go up. Uh, but the main thing, and unfortunately, about. The we, they're all rough numbers, but somewhere around 80 to 85 percent of our burglar motor vehicles are unlocked doors. <coughs> and it's literally people just walking down the street going, nope, nope, aha, that one opened, what's in here? Mm -hmm. and that's it. Just by locking your door, they will keep passing by your house. When I worked a burglary task force, we went to one neighborhood in North Bryan, and I walked the street. There's 40 houses on the street. And I probably counted 75 to 80 unlocked cars, and almost every one of them had valuables. And it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's horrible. If you just lock the door, most of them are going to move on. Unless you leave your valuables out, and they want them, then they're going to smash the window. So if you lock your car door and you hide your valuables, you shouldn't have that problem. The only ones you got to deal with those are the zombies. <laughs> the ones that are just like, ah, car, I got to break in. And they don't care. 
They're going to get in any, any means necessary, and they don't care what's in there. They're just going to get into it. Those are so rare. But you have no idea how easy it is to walk down the street and check door handles. So that's why we, we advocate that as much as we can. We talk about it on the radio all the time. It's on gas pumps. It's on billboards. But still, 80, 85%. So, yes, ma'am. Um, uh, reporting that, um, so say if, like, you know, they, they have a problem with their door handle, or they don't have something that's wrong. Oh, yes. 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 And we'll, we'll look. We want to come out and look because yeah. that could be anything from a criminal mischief. To a criminal trespass to a burglary it all depends on the intent and what they did um, but and that's sometimes those are precursors precursor if i could say yeah. that word correctly they may come out and break the lock on your shed and then two days later come out breaking your garage it may be a stepping stone or they may be checking your car door to get to the one next door to you and i'll tell you one other thing that most people wouldn't think to report if you're missing landscape uh like concrete blocks around your tree or your flower gardens and you like 10 of them are missing all of a sudden when I they're using them to prop up the cars if they take off the tire and rims so it'd be good to know where they came from you know if you report them um, it's patterns yes, yeah. patterns and trends and we, we can tell that we'll have neighborhoods that we'll get a, a rash of burglars they'll walk every house in the neighborhood and then neighborhoods are like, oh my gosh what happened the whole neighborhood's been decimated and they won't come back to the neighborhood for a month yeah. we got some houses that get hit every week every week and what I, I try to tell people is that sometimes burglars are like stray dogs if you keep feeding them they keep coming back if they don't get a meal from you they're going to go somewhere else I'd rather have them go somewhere else's yard like <laughs> college station <laughs> out of Brazos County, of Brazos County. somewhere else yeah. um, I say that loving me and my friends at college station yeah. we give each other a hard time but we work with each other really well we, we always love it because, uh, like you said, we do get along, but like if the media or on the media headlines it says "college station man arrested for like Brian crime," we love that. Because, <laughs> because for a while it'll always be Brian man arrested for you know burglary in college station. And we're like the burglary task force. I did that from last year. I did it uh, around the holidays, around Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, and we arrested a gentleman that, that had literally on a bicycle started in South College Station near Saltgrass. Broke into three or four different cars, kept riding his bicycle all the way up to where all the sorority and fraternity houses are. Kept riding his bicycle, <laughs> and then we caught him right when he came into Brian. Oh. It was just luck. Just happened to be in the right place at the right time, mm -hmm. made contact for the right reason, got a bunch of stolen items off of him, including a firearm. And we started calling people, hey, I've got your credit card, hey, I've got your driver's license. Half of them said, yes, I've already reported that to College Station Police Department. Half of them like, no, my wallet's in my purse, it's in my car. Not anymore. Why don't you go outside and look? Oh, my car's been broken into. Yes, why don't you go and call the call station <laughs> police department and let them come out. So crime knows no borders. As I mentioned earlier, drugs don't know borders neither to criminals. They don't recognize city limit signs. They just keep right on coming. And so we do share that back and forth with college stations sometimes. So we do share information. Our detectives work with their detectives to work on burglary rings and narcotics rings and all those things. So and kind of along the same note, you know, sometimes we, and then the reason why I say we get flack on social media is because I run the social media page, but sometimes we'll get a lot of comments about, you know, stopping people for, why are you stopping people for this or insignificant, like maybe a, they didn't use their blinker. Okay, let's use that as an example. When you have all this stuff going on, well, a lot of times, you know, when I was on patrol, I didn't stop someone who didn't use their blinker because I wanted to stop them for their, not using their blinker. It was because there were burglaries going on in that neighborhood, and I'm going to find any reason to stop anybody that was there. And it just helped us, like, you know, when, once I contact, I'm not going to give them a ticket for it. I contact them to see, okay, do you belong in this neighborhood, or do you live here? Okay, fine. You know, you, you're good. But then I find someone who ha doesn't belong there. And then I can take that a little step further. Well, who do you know here in this neighborhood? And that's why we ask those questions. It's not because we're being nosy or because, you know, we're trying to violate someone's rights or anything like that. It's because something is going on in your neighborhood and we're trying to stop it. The guy that I stopped with the stolen gun and all those credit cards and stuff, bicycle. No headlight. Yeah. That was the legal. That's our number one that stop. That was the legal reason that I had to stop and detain him. And I didn't do it because he was on a bicycle with no headlight. I did it because he was acting strange and suspicious. I can prove the elements of that offense. Mm -hmm. And that was, it's easy stop, detention, and then figure out 
who are you, why are you in this neighborhood, yeah. what are you doing, why are you acting out of place? Because the mannerisms in which he contacted me were not consistent with people who are in a normal frame of mind. So sometimes you see that on TV, you're like, why did the cops stop him for that? Well, mm -hmm. that's because that's what we had. <laughs> And then we can investigate further after we get the car stops. Yeah. I think she said she had a question. Yeah, this is my last question. I was going to say, um, like, what, this is kind of really why we came, but for them at their age, but also all, all of us, like, what is the most helpful thing, like, as a community that we can do for Brian to be? And the kids at their age, too, right? Yeah, I would say report anything that's out of the ordinary. Um, we catch, the, number, the major reason why we catch burglars is because someone called and said, Something's not right. I saw this guy, he, he was at the front door of my neighbor's house, they were out of town for a week, and, and he just walked around the corner towards the back. I didn't see anything, I don't know if he's breaking in, but you know, this is what he's wearing, and be descriptive. I mean, that's, that's the biggest thing. Sometimes people call and say something's happening and hang up. When our officers who are responding need more information, like, well, what was he wearing, what did he look like, did he have glasses, did he have tattoos, was, you know, uh, shorts, pants, you know, all those kind of questions that seem menial, but they're very good for us because then we may, we may show up and he's three blocks down the road instead of going straight to that house and, oh, nothing's going on here. So, that's the biggest a, thing. We have approximately 150 officers who work for Brian PD. Mm -hmm. We have 80 some thousand residents. We can't, and that's how many we have full staff. That's not how many are on the street at a time. We can't be everywhere in every neighborhood at all times. We don't know what's out of place in your neighborhood. You do. You're the expert where you live. So that's what we rely on is those phone calls. And I get, I get those, I, I hate to bother you, but you're not bothering me. Mm -hmm. You are not bothering me because something is out of place in your neighborhood and that could be a telltale sign that something else is going on. So get involved, call. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to call. We don't, we don't advocate to people to walk up and try to stop a crime in progress. Uh, unless you feel compelled to do so, but that's a safety thing. And an individual. But please call us, let us know. You're not bothering us. That's what we're here for. Um, and then if you see us out and about, we're people just like you. Inside all this stuff is a person, um, kids, mortgage, all that stuff, right? Went to college, got bills, understand that, trying to do my job, just be polite. I'm going to try to be as polite as I can to you. I, yes, I do have a bad day every now and then, and it's nothing personal against you. We all have bad days, and we try to minimize those bad days as much as we can. But be friendly. I, like I said, this is how Kelly and I are anywhere we are in the public. We like to engage people, talk to you. Uh, so and we're some, just here to help you. I'm going to take this moment, too, to plug that we have um, several academies that are free to the public. Uh, we have the English Academy, Citizens Police Academy, which is about 11 weeks long. It's every Thursday night from 6.30 to 9.30. Um, and you get to visit with every different, almost every different department. So canine will come in. They'll do a demonstration with their dogs. They, you know, do all of that. It is for adults only. Sorry. <laughs> um, we do have a, we have a Spanish-speaking one for um, people who don't know English. And, and it's all Spanish. We have people who translate all the presenters' information. And then we have a junior police academy, and that's for kids that are going into the 10th, 11th, and 12th grades the following year. So it's every summer. It's usually in June. It's two weeks long. Um, so, I mean, if you're interested in e any of those, you know, feel free to holler at me and let me know. And that regardless whether you're in public school or homeschooled or any of that, but you, you had to be going into the 9th or 10th grade, but I've accepted some that are going into the 9th if we had the numbers and had the openings. But Our next academy starts in February. Yep. <laughs> and I happen to know the guy and the gal that can run it, and they're real awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so. Any other questions? Classical rules. Yeah, awesome. it's basically. You're a car. <laughs> yeah. You got to stop at stoplights. You got to signal your turns. Uh, if it's after dark, you have to have a light attached to your bicycle. Could be a flashlight duct a tape. White, white lights in front of your vehicle. And you have to have a red light to the rear, or at least a red reflector. But typically a red light emanating to the rear. You have to stop at all stop signs, all crosswalks, just like a car. If you're on a sidewalk, it's not where bicycles are supposed to be. You're a pedestrian. But that means that when you come to an intersection, you get off that bicycle and you walk it across. 
Bicycles remain to be driven on a roadway. That is actually the safest place for them. As close to the curb as possible. Close to the curb as possible. So, so the bike can be on the sidewalk? It's yes. Just you just have to yield to someone walking. Yeah, you have and, to get out and of that's way. one of those things because a lot of people go, it's so much safer because there's no cars up there. And that's true until you come to an intersection or a driveway. Yeah, I won't let my kid ride his bike in the street. I mean, I'd rather okay. him be on the sidewalk. So. And I won't let mine ride on the sidewalk. <laughs> I've taught him how to, when he's on that bike, he owns the lane. Now, when I'm riding down Boonville and cars are doing 70 and I'm doing 15 if I'm lucky, <laughs> no, no comments. Uh, I'm on the sidewalk, but that sidewalk on Boonville is 10 feet wide. You know, I'm talking about a narrow city sidewalk where if there's a pedestrian, bicycle is going to be in the way. The safest place for a bicycle is in the lane of traffic, closest to the curb. <coughs> I always wear a helmet. But while we're while we're on that on the on the flip side, if you're a pedestrian, if there's a sidewalk provided, you should be on that. If there's not one, you need to be walking against traffic by the curb because you need to be able to look at people coming at you in case they're not doing or paying attention, then you can jump and get out of the way. But if you're walking with traffic and someone pies you from behind, you're at fault because you're on the wrong side of the road. Bicycle safety and pedestrian safety. The biggest yeah. thing I'll tell you is know your roadway. There are streets in town I will not ride my bicycle on, period, end of discussion. I will go out of my way to stay off of those roads because of the layout of the road and what they're made for. Same thing if you're walking. Please be safe. A lot of cars see you. They're texting. They're doing something else. They're, they're worried about being late to work, and they see, a, they see a, a pedestrian or a bicyclist, and it's too late. So think about your route. Make your route as safe as possible. I enjoy riding my bicycle, I really do, but I, I modify my route whenever I ride it to make sure I stay off of those those bad streets. You know where they are. If, so. if someone's coming on the bike and they need to make a left, can they take up the whole yep. lane? Yes, they yes. can. Yes, they can. That bike is a vehicle. It can take up a whole lane, part of a lane. Typically, bicycles will move to the right side of the lane because a bicycle and a car can sometimes share the same lane of travel. If that lane's not big enough, if I'm in it, I drift over on that lane. Mm -hmm. And to go around me, you're gonna have to pass me. If I need to make a left-hand turn, I just move over to the left lane and make the turn when it's mm -hmm. safe to do so. It's a little harder to do in a bike yeah. than it is in a car. Because in a car, you turn that turn signal on and you're big enough, you can kind of move over and you're usually moving at the same speed as other vehicles. A bicycle's moving a lot slower so usually when I ride my bike, I have to get over way early. I find a gap in the traffic where it's safe, and I move all the way across to where I need to go. And it gets, it gets a little exciting at some points. <laughs> so, cars get annoyed. Yes, they do. They do. But again, you're a vehicle just like they are. You have just as much right to that roadway that the car does. The unfortunate part is if there's a collision, car always wins. Car beats bike. Sorry. So. Do what? Oh yeah, you bet, you bet. And in fact, funny story, there's a picture on campus of a campus a &M bicycle stopping a Corvette on a traffic stop. Bicycle stop Corvette, yes sir. In a car, uh, hope it didn't hurt yourself. In the car. Uh, you pull over and you let us know. Yeah. And we'll come out and make sure that you're okay and that hopefully the animal's okay. And if not, we'll take care of the animal. <laughs> y'all been great. It's late. Thank really you. appreciate y'all coming today. Don't forget your goodies over here. If you got any questions, Kelly and I will be here for a few minutes. We'd be more than happy to answer any questions. We'll get you set up in the Citizens Police Academy. Yes.